Hello citizens of Earth and welcome to Station 204. So glad to have you here this week. And we've got a bit to go over with Ryan in our SpaceX update talking about the quick pace that SpaceX is moving at. I've got Starliner coming back into the fray. We've also got some weather in space from Dr. Tamitha Scove and a little bit of celebrity gossip at the end. Yeah, just a little bit. Don't worry, you're gonna like it. Now, before we officially get started, of course, just wanna remind you that if you like what we do here at Tomorrow, don't forget to subscribe to us, like our videos, set up notifications, comment below, and share us everywhere that you can because every little bit helps us out. So let's go ahead and get started with your tomorrow news for October 6th, 2020. And Ryan, be speedy about it. JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi is not only going to be travelling on Crew-1 with SpaceX, but he is also currently in talks with them to get a seat on the Dear Moon mission, which is currently slated to take the Japanese artist Yasuku Mezawa around the moon on a little holiday to make some stunning pieces of art. The annual Starship update has been somewhat announced to be taking place in three weeks, which I am very excited about, as we are going to hear some juicy new details about Starship. The most exciting part of this is that what is presented will actually be what flies to orbit as V1.0, to quote Elon directly, which I'm pretty sure means that SN8 is actually going to space. SN8 has also just been mounted to the launch mount, which means we shouldn't be too far away from a static fire and then a hop, which is getting me so excited about the future of this vehicle and space travel as a whole because so much progress has been made in relatively very little time. Thanks for that quick update, Ryan. SpaceX wants to send people to Mars. Right, and in order to do that, you're going to need water. That's kind of important. Well, a recent announcement from the European Space Agency has found that there may actually be areas on Mars where it's a little bit more wet than we were expecting it to be. A few years ago, the European Space Agency's Mars Express Orbiter used its ground-penetrating radar instrument, the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding, also called MARSES, to ping radar signals off of materials below the surface. And at Mars's South Pole, there were several returns that indicated a subsurface lake existed. Now, at that time, only 29 observations had been made over three years, so that's really not enough to have a very good data set, but the new one that they used has 134 observations over seven years. So still uh, not really a lot, but hey, a lot more than that first study did. Now, those 134 observations don't entirely confirm the presence of a 30 kilometer wide subsurface lake, but those do add a lot more weight to the validity that yes, there likely is one and hopefully addresses some of that skepticism surrounding the study. Now, in addition, there's data showing that there would be several smaller subsurface lakes about one kilometer wide around the main subsurface lake. And here on Earth, we do find life in subglacial lakes in Antarctica. So could that mean these subsurface lakes of Mars could be a habitat for life off of Earth? Well, these data don't appear to be on life's side. Now Mars's subsurface is way too cold for just fresh water itself to be liquid and not freeze. So there has to be something in that water in order to prevent it from freezing. And scientists think that they are likely hypersaline. That means that there's a lot of salt in that liquid water preventing it from freezing. Now we do have hypersaline lakes here on Earth and we do find life in them up to about five times the saltiness of the Earth's oceans. Unfortunately on Mars with running models, they figured out the conditions would require that lake to be about 20 times saltier than the Earth's ocean. So if there is life in those lakes, it's going to be way different than what we have here on Earth. It's probably going to be like extra pickled or something like that. And speaking of salt, you all love to put that in the comments anytime we do a Starliner story. So I'm going to go grab some popcorn, get myself ready for you throwing that all at us, and let's talk a little bit about Starliner. At a meeting of NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, the committee reported that Boeing was making substantial progress towards Orbital Flight Test 2, the second uncrewed test flight of a Starliner after Orbital Flight Test 1 in December 2019 suffered multiple near-catastrophic anomalies. Boeing is nearing the end of assembly for both the Starliner crew module that'll fly OFT2 and the service module that will be used as well. However, the committee made it quite clear that Boeing's timeline of OFT2 happening before the end of 2020 was highly doubtful. 
The first crewed test flight of a Starliner capsule is currently scheduled for no earlier than June 2021. And that's the assumption of all going well during that test flight. And that would place the first operational Starliner crew flights towards the end of 2021. But there is some good news. The safety committee is pleased with how Boeing is now handling the program, and Boeing has been quite forthcoming about the resolution of problems. In addition, the committee also commended NASA for taking the recommendations, planning, and quality assurance that they are asking of Boeing and applying that to their own efforts, such as the Space Launch System and the Orion spacecraft. It's a classic engineering case. You learn more from your failures than you do your successes. And that's why you test and test and test and test and test and test and test. Now, Boeing should have kind of gotten it right out of the gate, but hey, at least they're getting ready to do OFT2 whenever that actually flies. So let's go ahead and start hopping around the world though, because we have got some launches to talk about this week. We're even gonna go up to low Earth orbit for your space traffic. Starting off in China, a Long March 4B lifted off on September 27th at 0323 Universal Time from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center. Carrying a payload of two Wuanjing environmental satellites, they were successfully placed into orbit where optical and hyperspectral imagers will collect information such as vegetation distribution and water quality. Of note regarding this launch, there was no prior publishing of keep out zones for aircraft called notice to airmen. China does not typically announce launches, but they do usually publish these notices. However, they did not for this launch. They just sent it up without warning anyone. Thanks. Zipping west over to the Plistix Cosmodrome in Russia, a Soyuz 2.1B rocket lifted off on September 28th at 1120 Universal Time. Carrying a primary payload of three Gonets secure communications and tracking satellites, they were successfully deployed into the proper orbit. The Frigga upper stage then moved to a lower orbit, deploying 19 small sats and nanosats from a multitude of companies and institutions, such as ExoLaunch, Kepler Communications, Spire, and several CubeSats from universities in Germany and the United Arab Emirates. Heading down to a busy Cape Canaveral, Florida, a United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy set off from Space Launch Complex 37 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on September 28th at... What? Oh, they scrubbed? Okay, well, moving on. Later on September 28th from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, a SpaceX Falcon 9 lifted off carrying the 12th batch of Starlink, oh, weather scrub. All right, well, um, moving along then, back to Space Launch Complex 37 with the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy prepared to loft NROL 44 on September 29th at, ooh, Lightning strike near the pad? Yeah, that'll scrub you. Okay. Uh, all right then. Um, you, uh, let's push it a bit later then, hmm? October 1st? Yeah. Back at Slick 37 on October 1st, a United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy, its triple barrel body needed to lift a National Reconnaissance Office payload. Seven, six, five, four. and stand by. There's been a hold called. Didn't lift off. It aborted. Seven seconds left in the count. And that's another scrub. And we'll get back to the Delta IV Heavy in like a week. Well, later on October 1st, back at Launch Complex 39A, a SpaceX Falcon 9 carrying the 12th batch of Starlink satellites. Aborted. 18 seconds before liftoff. Scrubbing the launch. Okay, so maybe Kennedy Space Center is having a string of bad luck. Let's just, let's just, you know, let's go. Let's just mosey on up the uh, coast to pad 0A at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, where I know we've left the bad luck behind. Leaving the pad at 0143 Universal Time on October 2nd, a Northrop Grumman Antares carrying Cygnus NG-14 to resupply the International Space Station. Okay. NLC, this is a uh, prop lead. We are LCG, in OTCS G2 automated abort. Corp Nav, telemetry verified. This is launch team on countdown one, abort, abort. This is LC on countdown one, abort, abort. We didn't leave the pad. It also aborted. What if, just, okay. 
let's skip ahead about 24 hours, where we once again have Antares with Cygnus NG14 apparently going to lift off supposedly on October 3rd, allegedly at 0116 Universal. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about it until something happens. Look, I'm not, uh-uh. Five. Oh yeah, four, keep counting. Sure, three, two, one. Engine start and lift off. The SS Kalpna Chavla takes flight, sights set on the International Space Station. We'll snap it launched. Well, uh, there goes what was, yeah, there goes Antares carrying Cygnus NG 14 cargo resupply craft to the International Space Station, leaving the pad at 0116 Universal Time on October 3rd from the Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. Antares successfully placed Cygnus NG-14 into orbit, where the cargo craft deployed its solar arrays and began a multi-day chase to catch up with the International Space Station. That was a launch. Finally, back down to the Cape. We're at Space Launch Complex 40 on October 3rd at 0143 Universal Time, a SpaceX Falcon 9 carrying GPS-3 space vehicle. And we have an abort. All agencies stand by. Didn't lift off. It aborted at T minus two seconds. Here we go again. Okay, maybe Cygnus NG-14 can give us some good luck again, and it does. Arriving at the International Space Station in the early morning hours of October 5th. The Cygnus NG-14 spacecraft is named the SS Kalpana Chawla in honor of her. Kalpana was the first Indian woman to fly into space and was a mission specialist on STS-87 in 1997 and then flew again as a mission specialist on STS-107, which broke apart on re-entry on February 1st, 2003. The SS Kalpana Chawla maneuvered towards and was captured by the station's Canon Arm 2 at 0931 Universal Time and berthed to the Unity module at 1201 Universal Time. Supplies aboard include additional nitrogen to help maintain the station's air mixture due to the recent increase of a tough to find leak, a camera which will be used to create videos to allow spacewalks to be experienced in VR. Well, that sounds pretty darn cool. Scientific experiments and a new titanium construction toilet similar to the one that will fly aboard Orion. Enjoy the new commode, y'all. All right, well, I'm feeling pretty good. We just got some of that good luck from Antares and Cygnus NG14. So let's get this Falcon 9 with Starlink 12 up at 1151 Universal Time on October 5th and scrubbed for weather. Who knows if these rockets are actually going to launch since we're now in Scrubtoberfest, but here are your upcoming launches in case you'd like to watch them sit on the path. And for this week's space weather, here's Dr. Tamitha Scope. Space weather this week calms down from a big solar storm that we had just this past week. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see the culprit there. That's that coronal hole that gave us a big burst of fast solar wind, and it brought Aurora clear down to west of Liverpool in England. And it also brought Aurora down to the top tier of the United States before it finally began to wane. Now, also, we have region 2773 that's also going to be rotating to the sun's far side, and there's not a lot left after. After that so it looks like we're going to get a reprieve and that's some really good news and now for your leo mio geo orbit outlook as we switch to our low energy particle environment now these are the fluxes that cause surface charging on the outside of spacecraft including the solar arrays that then can discharge and cause electrical short circuits and upsets you can see the fluxes in and around geo have not been all that bad the past couple days we've had a couple injections in and around the dawn side but they really haven't built up all that much we keep getting these particles flushed so the fluxes are staying reasonably low and that's good news for satellite operators in geo it doesn't look like spacecraft charging 
flooding is going to be an issue like it was a few days ago during the solar storm. These fluxes were much higher. However, as we switch to our higher energy particle environment, now these are the particles that can penetrate deeply into the spacecraft interior and cause deep dielectric charging and internal charging upsets. You can see it in around the 30th, we started having some decent injections and it started building up the fluxes in the geo, inside of geo just a little bit indefinitely as we move closer to the MEO orbits. And as we look at the uh, electron fluxes, you can see for the two MeV electron fluxes in and around the 30th is where we really started crossing that alarm threshold, that risk threshold for internal charging. And sure enough, over the past few days, we have maintained uh, a, a decent level above that, uh, that uh, electron flux threshold charge risk. And so we are going to continue to have a risk for internal charging and it's an integrated effect. So the longer it stays above that threshold, the bigger risk for uh, internal charging. So you satellite operators, that could be an issue for you. And as we take a look at our radiation clock, you can actually see that inner ring is it, which shows the internal charging risk. It's bad all the way from dawn clear to midnight. So satellite operators, you may not have a risk for surface charging over these next few days, but the risk for deep dielectric charging is still there and it will continue to be so until that uh, radiation belt begins to die down a little bit, which could easily be maybe three or four days from now. For more details on this week's space weather, including some gorgeous aurora photos, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Earlier this year, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said that they were looking at the possibility of working with Tom Cruise to get the actor up to the International Space Station to potentially film in space. And just a few weeks ago, that was confirmed that yes indeed, Cruise is going to be going. The mission has been procured through Axiom Space, a private aerospace company who is working with NASA to develop a private module for the International Space Station, along with their own free-flying private space station and providing services to get seats on space flights, of which they have two confirmed private Crew Dragon missions to the International Space Station purchased for themselves. The mission, which is known as SpaceX Axiom Space One, or AX-1, is currently set to launch around October 2021. Michael Lopez Alegria, a retired NASA astronaut who flew on three shuttle missions, an expedition to the International Space Station, and performed 10 EVAs over the course of his career, will be the commander. Tom Cruise will not be going solo, though. Film director Doug Lyman will be coming along as well. Cruise and Lyman worked together in their respective roles in 2014's Edge of Tomorrow and 2017's American Made. So they're pretty well familiar with each other. I think this is a pretty cool thing. This is like a real chance for folks who usually aren't interested in spaceflight to actually get excited about spaceflight and see something really awesome happening that you don't see all the time. And I wouldn't be too worried about flying a celebrity like Cruz to the International Space Station. He has several decades of experience flying with a multi-engine instrument rating commercial pilot's license. That's pretty high up there. And he's frequently seen flying a World War II P-51 Mustang that he owns, totes jealous, and no word on if his time in F-14s and F-18s in the top gun films count towards the jet experience NASA likes to see from astronauts, but I don't think that hurts as well. And as we wrap up this news, I want to thank all of you citizens who help contribute to make the shows of tomorrow possible. All of this is done because of the amazing support you all give us. We would not be able to do anything like this without your help. And if you would like to join the ranks of citizens, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join and check out all the levels and rewards that you get. At the escape velocity level of support, we've opened up early access to new scripts, so if you'd like to see the bad jokes and the spelling errors written out in real time, this is your chance. And that's in addition to the escape velocity room in our Discord, where you get direct access to those of us who are actually on the show. Uh, don't know if that's something you'd want, but hey, it's there. And of course, subscribing to us, liking our videos, setting up notifications, commenting below, and sharing our shows everywhere that you can is the easiest way to be an incredible help to all of us. And that's Seco9 for this week's edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for watching us. And remember, until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring.
Engine start and lift off. Attitude nominal, equal substance nominal. Engines are steady and nominal. Attitude nominal. Attitude nominal. All vehicle subsystems are nominal. Attitude nominal, vehicle subsystems nominal. Attitude nominal, vehicle subsystems nominal. Attitude nominal. Attitude nominal. LC, ace out.